Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, let me take like another second to really appreciate the Aracon team for putting this amazing event together. So Lucia, John, Adri, Delphi, everyone. It's like completely amazing that you pulled this off. So really thank you so much. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, so actually it took me it took me a little while to figure out what I wanted to talk about in Aracon. Uh, and I figured since you're going to be learning a lot from a lot of smart people today, I would just do like a little story time and do kind of like a year-by-year -year overview of the, of the Argon project. Uh, but first, we kind of have to start with some Argon prehistory. Uh, so this is like the question that I'm going to answer right now. is like the second most asked question that we get after Web Binance. It's how did you and Louis meet? And the answer always is on Twitter. And this is actually like the, the first tweet that I ever sent to Luis on Twitter, like in July 2011, when I found his resume online. And I was like basically freaking out that this, this kid had built like an operating system distro when he was just 12. Uh, and we started like a community of kids that programmed in Spain. We finally met like a year later. So this is a picture from us and the, His Holiness, the King of Spain right now. Uh, he took a selfie with my phone. Uh, I sold it. Uh, so yeah, and then we started. We started a company together when we were 15. It's actually a picture from the keynote that we that we did. Uh, we were actually doing like a loyalty cards thing on your phone, and it was super exciting. We were the, we were the first app that would only work by passbook. So if you had a an iPhone, you didn't even need to download an app. You just scanned a QR code and it worked. Uh, we put a lot of effort in the technology, not so much in the business side. We took it to customers, and they were like, oh, but you have like integration with my t whatever system. And we were like, no. Um, so yeah, they, it didn't take off, but it was like a great learning experience. And then kind of starting getting a, like a m better relationship. And then we kind of like, Louis started doing his own thing. I started doing my own thing. But then it was in 20, 2016 when kind of I was transitioning jobs. Louis was getting out of his previous startup, Stampery. And he called me up and he was like, I have this amazing idea to get rid of patent trolls. I was like, tell me more about it. And he was like, you were doing like some AI research, right? I'm like, yeah. And he, he told me, I have this idea of brute forcing the patent system. So we have a computer that invents everything in the world. So patent trolls cannot patent it because our system will already have patented it. So we went to the Bali. Uh, we started pitching investors. And this is a picture, like kind of like the entrepreneur uh, dream. And uh, can you see that I'm like falling down? That's kind of like this three months went. Uh, so we were like basically like pivoting on the idea, like eating eating belly very healthy, as you can see. We kind of started doing like a crowdfunding to kill stupid patents. So that was that was a lot of fun. We're basically pitching, trying to fundraise to everyone that would hear us talk. Uh, this is in like Cosla Ventures in a very fancy office in Sand Hill Road, um, and it yeah like people were like we love your vision, we totally buy this, but this is like never going to be like a business like this that we like here in Silicon Valley. Uh, so we kind of like were thinking about what to do and like potential customers were telling us we just want insurance. Like we want to pay you guys some money and forget about this, this problem. So we're like, yeah, doing an insurance fund legally is like a hassle. So one day out of the blue, we decided to do, what if we do it in a smart contract? So we set out to doing that. Uh, we created Provident One, which was a completely working smart contract system that allows you to create uh, completely unregulated insurance funds. Uh, and actually worked. This is like a screenshot of really terrible Solidity code. Uh, and we had a paper. And this was when we started seeing like, okay, we can, we can totally build this on, on this Ethereum thing. This is amazing. We can, we can do this. Um, and we kind of like were going down the insurance route. And then we, this is like one of the major turning points. This is the moment that we managed to convince Boost VC to invest $50,000 into our startup. And as you can see in this like Facebook Messenger conversation, when they confirmed the investment, Luis is like uh, telling him, can we up the valuation? And Brighton is like literally saying, guys, you're not in a very advanced stage as our other companies. You get what you get and you're, you're gonna be okay. And, and if you can see like, this is making a bet on yourselves, uh, not necessarily the current product. So they were literally pulling into <laughs> for us to do something else. And then with like the Silicon Valley 
accelerator deal, you get $100,000 in AWS credits. And we were doing like a crowdfunding thing, so we didn't need $100,000 in computing power. Um, so then this was the time the CCAS was, was launching. We heard about it, we really liked it. So we set up like a CCAS mining operation. This is Genesis block of CCAS, and we're tr trying to turn AWS credits into cryptocurrency. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is Luis with like cracking open, like seeing that we were selling like some CCAS at like three Bitcoin per CCAS. Like we sold like very s small fractions, and I was managing like 200 servers mining CCAS. TLDR is not very effective to mine cryptocurrency in cloud services, but. It was, it was fine. But the turning point here was when we met this guy in the CCAS forum, and he claimed that he had the best GPU mining algorithm. And we had like a lot of computing power. So we hopped on a Skype call, and we're like, dude, you ran your algorithm in, in our servers, and we served the profits. Um, it didn't wor go well, uh <laughs> but uh, we got thinking about this, like how can we like do business with this really sketchy guy uh, you know, and we don't trust to ha we don't need to trust each other. So we started like getting into this idea of doing like completely trustless companies to do absolutely trustless business. And then this happened, like three, literally three days later or something like that. This happened, and we were there in California, like in this little bubble. Uh, and it, like everyone was like scrambling around. We were working on getting our visa situation figured out, uh, and yeah. And then Luis, as analytical as he is, like he started doing like a document, like how does this impact our company? And it was like, very good, good, neutral, bad, or very bad. And most of them were either bad or very bad. It was like just the good. It's like, this is probably good for crypto because like, this is just accelerating the pace that the US dollar will stop being the reserve currency of the world. Um, but yeah, and then like three days later, I had a scheduled flight to Madrid. And then I, we kind of felt that we weren't coming back to Bali. We, had, we didn't have a lot of money, so it was cheaper for us to just leave and build a product in Spain. So while I was traveling back to, to Spain, Luis texted me this. He's like, yo, dude, I've been thinking about this unstoppable companies thing, and I kind of wrote a paper. Can you read it? And it took me like three days to read it um, because I was like with a friend uh, in the UK. But I was actually, yeah, this is kind of neat, but we're doing patents, right? He's like, no, 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 we're like, this is amazing. And I was like, okay, we can do it. We can build a prototype in two weeks, but no one's going to care. Uh, and he was like, okay, let's, let's just do it and see if people care. And like 25 day days later, we, have th we had the first Argon prototype on the, ran on the testnet, and we even had identity. Uh, so yeah, this was like very, like the best part of 2016 was figuring out that we were going all in with Argon. Which takes us to 2017, which I called the year of execution. Uh, but like at the beginning of 2017, we didn't even have a name. Like it was still called COSA, which is Spanish for thing. Uh, <laughs> And we didn't have a logo, so I called up Adri on the phone, and I was like, dude, Adri, we have this idea. We're calling it Aragon now. Uh, can you do something about the branding? We told him about what we wanted to do, and he was like, what do you want to do? And we're like, you're the artist. You figure it out. And this is Adri's first branding proposal for Aragon. Uh, he figured out we had to do an eagle, and this was the logo. And if you see it in detail, it's like very similar to the logo that we have here today. We just like changed the, the thing in the R and like put the letters more, more closely. But it was like absolutely love first at first sight with this branding proposal. Um, and then we finally came public with Aragon in February 10th, and we were blown away by the reception in the Ethereum community. Uh, and I think the th what, what made it so successful, like the, the announcement, like people could play with like a beta in like an iframe, is that we built a product. And people could understand the product. We didn't have the best smart contracts in the back end. Uh, it wasn't, we didn't have like a layer two protocol or whatever, but like people could understand and could see themselves using it. And I think that was like absolutely the, like what made Argon so successful within the community so quickly uh, is that we actually built a product and no one was or is building products. Um, and then we went to Paris to the very first EdCon, and it was like fascinating to finally get to to meet a lot of the people that we knew behind online handles. This is us pitching. Vitalik was in the first row in this very talk. You can send, like, find his tweets, which is like, decentralized companies are stupid if you don't have a decentralized court to solve 51% attacks. And he was right. Uh, <laughs> so he usually is. And then 
two weeks later, we launched the first public public alpha of Aragon. This was the first version of Aragon desktop. Then a few weeks later, we had we shipped 0 0.3, which was the uh, we called it the governance release because you could bring your own token and wrap it and use existing tokens, and you could have like different stock classes. As you can see, it's like very focused into like traditional Silicon Valley type companies still. Um, and then we we wrote the white paper. We were toying around with this idea of the of building a jurisdiction, even from the first day uh, from from the Aragon uh, original Aragon white paper in November 2016. So we actually wrote this and released this on April 20th, 2017. No pun intended with the date. That's just what happened. Um, and then we we did we did the token sale on May 17th. Uh, we did the token sale. This is a picture of Luis's apartment in Barcelona, and you can see projected on the wall. There was like 12 minutes to start, and like 500 people in our website. Those were the most stressful minutes of my life. I'm never gonna do this again, but it went well. Uh, <laughs> we were ra we raised 275,000 ETH in like 20 96 seven blocks. So that was that was great. And that at that point, we finally had money for hiring. It had been like us two all along. We had fifty thousand dollars. And we were spending most of it in legal and operations. It's in this moment, this is a call with Adri, and we finally got a got the team together finally in Offsite Zero. Um, and I remember very vividly in this offsite when we started thinking about if we ever do a conference, I said, we're calling it Aracon. And everyone laughed at me. <laughs> and now I'm, and now it's me the one who laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> And this is a schema, like also in the soft side, like this is a schema of the never released Aragon 0 0.4. So we completely we said, okay, this was fun, but let's do something more modular so people can build applications. Uh, and I remember, like, presenting this to the team, like, it was ab about to start doing audits. I remember that Oli told me, dude, wait one second. How are we going to build a front end for this? This is too complicated. I don't know what are we going to do. And we threw it, threw it away. Uh, I was I had actually a trip to the US. I canceled it. I didn't make the flight like three hours before and we started working on the new version of of Aragon OS which we we wrote the thing in like October and it's surprisingly how many of the things that we have in Aragon OS were actually built in a week uh, in Barcelona again. So yeah, this was like a very pivotal moment uh, out of this first time that the team got together. And this is kind of like the evolution in 2017. We went from like being two people uh, to having a team of 10 wonderful individuals and we were ready, to we had like our own OS almost ready. So it was, it was a very good end of the year. And then last year, 2018, I'm calling it the year of infrastructure and I'm not gonna go in very deep because probably most of you are familiar with most of the events. But it's not just infrastructure in terms of like DevOps or like Aragon OS or whatever. It's like infrastructure in all the sides of the project. So we started the year like launching Aragon Nest, which was like just an idea, and we actually deployed 1.5 million dollars during the during the year with to like 15 teams, and we actually shipped the first usable version of Aragon OS, Aragon OS 3, which was amazing, and we started auditing this. Um, and then this was like one of the most pivotal moments of of, of 2018, which we shipped finally a new version of the front end. We hadn't done a release in nine months because we were working so hard on adapting it to this new modular architecture. And just look how happy Maria is. It was like, this is the war room call for the, for the launch. And it was, it was a really, really great moment. And then we also started working more and more on the SDK so people could actually build their applications. And we launched this in, in, ETH, in ETH, ETH One Osiris. Uh, we also shipped the second version of the white paper, which is the Argon network that we're building right now. And we shipped the Argon survey app to start doing signaling to our community. So it was like a few months of a lot of activity. And then we did audits. Like, I didn't even try to put a date. It was like most of 2018. Doing audits is fun. I'm so happy that we now have security partner to do rolling audits because like one of audits are a lot of work, but both the White Hat Group and Consensus Diligence did an amazing job with their audits uh, that now support uh, a lot of money and no one has stolen it yet, knock on wood. Um, and yeah, and like right before DEF CON, we finally shipped Alba. And Alba was the first release that we put on the mainnet. And it was like a very nerve wracking moment, but as you can see, like the moment of like everyone concentrated and then like everyone like just drinking beer after shipping it, it was like a very great moment of doing like a major release with the entire team uh, in Prague all together. And John did AGP1. Like just a month later, we did the vote to approve the voting process for the project. 
uh, and it was also great. It was like, okay, we have this app on mainnet, let's use it to do our own, our own governance. Uh, and now we have a governance process that was legitimized by ANT holders. So again, this is how we started 2018 with 10 people. Uh, and at the end of 2018, uh, we had the Aragon Association at the top, a new legal entity uh, in, in Switzerland. And then we had these two programs. We had Flock uh, with 18 team members and the Aragon DAC with 19 members, and then 15 eaglets with 60 team members. So we completely went from having like one centralized organization with 10 people to having one organization with one people and then a lot of other organizations. As Luis said, it's like, it doesn't matter if you, uh, if you decentralize decision making, if everyone's, like, everyone's fate is depending of the on the same person. And now I want to talk about 2019, um, which I'm calling the year of product. This is like everything that goes from now on is like pure speculation and my own opinion. This is not Aragon's view, not even Aragon one's view. But I think it's very important for us to go back to focusing on product. In 2018, we did a lot of work in technical infrastructure that we needed to have all these nice things today. But it's time that we take like, this thing that works, this app, which is like beautiful and everything, into a product that a lot of people use. Someone was asking me yesterday, what is the success metric for Aragon in like five years? And he's like, how many people cannot imagine their life without using Aragon? Because it, it becomes so something so essential. And for that, we need to build a product that people understand and not just like a very secure backend. So how does 2019 start? Well, for one thing, we have the biggest organization in the world which cannot manage to pay their cooks for official visits. Uh, and then we have like 280 organizations on the blockchain that not even if someone wants to do something or like pass a budget, like these organizations will keep on working. Like no one, no one can stop them. Um, but today I really want to talk about uh, the next major release of, of the Argon client, uh, which we're codenaming Bella. And Bella is the biggest release since, I would say, Argon 0 0.2. Uh, it's the biggest release in which we focused on user experience, like, really a lot. And it's going to change how everyone uses and interacts with, with Argon. Um, and the first thing, uh, and the most important thing, is that we're putting the first steps in, as Luis said, a new way to package Argon. And I copied his slide, this slide from him, uh, but this is not Argon desktop. This is actually the first Argon mobile release. Um, <laughs> So in point seven, we'll finally, we'll finally have something that works in mobile. This is just the first step towards mobile. And we'll be doing a lot more effort into mobile because like, the people that are going to benefit from Aragon the most don't use a computer, maybe use a computer once a month. But this is not how they natively use, use the web. So this is like some screenshots of Aragon mobile. We have like our finances. We have designer view that you know and love from, from the Aragon client. Uh, we also have Bodian, of course, and you can check your permissions on the app. Um, we're super stoked about how the progress is going with mobile. We're also bringing notifications, finally. So this is both things, uh, notifications and activity in this beautiful panel. You will be able to see what the state of your pending transactions are and what happened when, while you were away in your DAO. This is kind of like putting the first step to having actual notifications for you to know uh, if something wrong is happening and you're not having to go to Aragon directly. We're, oh, uh, we're also bringing identity back. Um, so this is, uh, we're doing it in, in a local, non -con without consensus first, because we really want to get identity right. As you can see here, this is like the first uh, iteration of identity with this component that Joni previously shown uh, that allows us to have basically any identity system that we want here. And we're also going to be shipping the first version of the App Center in 0.7, uh, which is going to be the way for people to do on-chain upgradability, which is like a very hot topic, but this is like how it should look for users. It shouldn't be scary or talk about technical details. So yeah, I'm very, very happy uh, that my team allowed me to say that Aragon 1 intends to ship 0.7 Bella this spring. Uh, so that's really, really exciting. Uh, but that's, that's not all. Uh, the development is going surprisingly well. So we're actually going to be shipping some of the features that will be released with Bella in a sneak peek in the next minor Aragon version, 0.6.3. And now I'm going to change over to my phone to see if you can, I can show you a little bit about this. So if we can switch to the phone. 
Cool. So yeah, this is the first version of Argon Mobile running on a Web3 on a mobile Web3 browser, and it's exactly how you should expect it. Like you don't see like the panel all the time because you can you can get it out whenever whenever you need it, and you can do everything that you can do on Argon right now from the from the mobile version. So let's check the finances of the Argon One DAO. This is actually our live DAO in production. Uh, so we can see we have a bunch of A and T, not a lot of DAI because we just did payroll and we're waiting for the association to give us our flow grant. Uh, but yeah, you can see here like the January payroll, uh, January payroll and A and T, like a bunch of A and T vesting contracts that we can go and check with the new identity component. We could go and see it in Etherscan. Uh, we can also, of course, check all the votings that have happened in this very democratic organization. Let's see this payment to send 122. A thousand die. You can see that the voting was executed because two A1 holders approved it, um, and we can even check our permissions to see if anything fishy is going on in our DAO. And let's see who has access to the vault. Oh yeah, it's fine. Only only finance as it should be, and we would try to revoke it from here if we wanted to, but we're not gonna do that right now because that would break our DAO. So yeah, that's that's a sneak peek of of Argo Mobile that will be coming in 0.6.3. So we can go back to the slides now. Thank you. And I'm like extremely stoked to announce that the team uh, managed to pull it off so that what you saw wasn't like a staging build or like my, com my phone connected to something weird. This is like actual Aragon on mainnet. So this is available now. Uh, and you can go and use Aragon Mobile right now. Just go to the normal URL for the app. Try it out and let us know what you think of the first Argo mobile version. <laughs> so, Aragon Network, uh, I don't have to announce it again. Like, as the team said, we're making a lot of progress in the research and development of the Argon Network. We're going to be shipping the first Argon Network version uh, this year with dispute resolution for uh, proposal agreements. Uh, and this is super, super exciting that we're going to be having this first service protocol in the Argon network that is going to be controlled and only ANT holders or ANJ holders that put ANT will be able to work for all of us uh, resolving our disputes and protecting our DAOs from 51% attacks. So yeah, 2020, what are we, what are we doing in 2020? So I'm, I'm at this point, it's like wild speculation. But I think 2020 is going to be the year of scale. Uh, it has to be. Uh, and I'm not talking about technical scalability again, uh, but I'm talking about we need to scale our processes and our communities so we can handle things as, as like, how do we coordinate 15 flock teams? Uh, even if we don't have 15 flock teams in 2020, like we have to have the, the, the processes in place and the structures so that we can manage that. Or how do we handle 100 AGPs every boat? Are people going to be able to put attention in 100 proposals? Uh, so there's like a lot for us uh, to figure out in terms of scalability of the project. But we also need to talk about blockchain scalability, which is like definitely the elephant in the room. Um, we've run some numbers. Uh, and if Aragon grows by two orders of magnitude, it, its daily use, which is something that we consider is not crazy for some time in 2020, Aragon will be using 20%, sorry, 50% of the entire Ethereum network throughput. And this is like only counting on us, but there's like a lot of other apps that are getting more and more adoption and we'll be getting more and more adoption throughout this year. So what we need to avoid is to have Aragon be super expensive because if, if we don't do any scalability work, then in 2020 people are gonna say, I really want to create my DAO, but this is really gonna take my, my entire month's salary. And this is something that we, we, cannot, we cannot do, and we have to take the scalability problem as our own. It's been a while since we were focusing on the other stuff, shipping mainnet, in which we were like, oh yeah, someone else will figure scalability for us. It didn't happen. Uh, so we've taken, these past few months after shipping mainnet, we've taken a way more active approach to solving scalability. And we're doing three things towards scalability. Number one is we're completely redesigning the Aragon voting stack. Uh, we're calling it Aragon Voting V2. Uh, and this completely changes uh, the most, uh, the biggest bottleneck for Aragon scalability, which is voting. Uh, so we're working on a layer two protocol on Ethereum to do vote aggregation. Uh, it also comes with a perk that almost any ERC20 will be able to be used for Aragon voting. So we're not going to be using Minimi anymore. Sorry, Jordi, it's too expensive. 
Um, but yeah, and we have like proof of concepts for this. We're currently scaling at 10.72x, uh, which is not bad, but uh, recent uh, research advancements are going to make us scale it way beyond. And this is talking uh, scalability on Ethereum, putting both in pretty much in layer two. Um, then we're, of course, very, very bullish on Ethereum Serenity. Uh, Serenity is the biggest upgrade to the Ethereum protocol, uh, which will shard the blockchain in um, 1,024 shards that are protected by proof of stake. These are shards that are completely homogeneous. Uh, so like we, you will have just right on one blockchain with one state, you will have 1,024 blockchains and ways to move state from one to the other at some point. Uh, we're very we really took seriously the Ethereum Serenity. We're actually, if I don't recall, cor if I recall correctly, the first ones to give out a grant to Prismatic Labs that you will hear from them later, which are the one of the leading teams implementing ETH 2.0. Uh, so we're very, very invested in making Serenity work. But also today, I want to talk about something that uh, it's kind of like feels bad to do an announcement. It's not an announcement, but it, it's taking like a big part of our research attention and our mind share that is. At some point, we would have to say that we're really working on this, even though it's like still wild speculation. Uh, but we're really considering uh, having our own layer one blockchain um, on the Polkadot network. This will allow us to have Argon OS and some of the Argon native primitives for having DAOs completely native, so they can be super, super efficient. This also allows us to subsidize uh, proper DAO usage. It can be an opinionated blockchain. It, it's, it would have a virtual machine, like a general purpose VM, but we can say, if you're running a DAO, it's more important than if you're running CryptoKitties or Crypto Eagles. Uh, so we can do these things and have other people that want to build stuff on our blockchain subsidized for people that are using Aragon. Uh, and this is kind of one of the steps in the process with like Aragon voting v2 of making Aragon virtually free to use because like, no one cares about gas and fees. Like people just want to use products, and people really shouldn't have to care about why do they have to pay and wait. Uh, so having our own layer one blockchain will allow us to have way bigger control. Um, as I said, this is like very early research process, but at this point, I would love to see some flock teams to apply and build the Argon chain full time. This is something that Argon One is not going to take on full time. We're doing some of the research, but we're waiting for some teams to take on it and build it full time. So yeah, that was that was kind of it. Um, this is a closing thought. Uh, it's really really amusing again uh, how many people have turned out to this event. Uh, but kind of last week was even bigger for us. Uh, the AGP vote was like such a pivotal moment in the in the project's life. It was like people really took out to the polls and decided what projects to fund, uh, what proposals we didn't want, or what proposals we did want, uh, and we allocated six million dollars of capital by ANT holders. Uh, what I'm saying with this is that we're in this amazingly privileged position uh, as a community that. We have a bunch of money. Okay, we used to have more, but we still have, uh, like, we still have the same ETH. We people are valuing it less, but we have uh, this massive amount of resources that we can deploy to make the Argon Manifesto happen in the world. And we don't respond to anyone. We don't have any VC that wants to sell in five years, and it's going to force us to sell our company or whatever. Uh, we don't have a hedge fund that wants to sell, like flip the company for 3x in two years. We really don't respond to anyone, and we have this massive pool of funds to deploy into making whatever we want to make and to extend the Argo Manifesto in the world. So if you want to do something, um, don't tell me to do it. Don't tell Luis to do it. Don't tell Argon one. Like, just create an AGP and convince the community. And if we do something that you don't like, like, don't just rant on, rant on Twitter. Make an AGP so that can never happen again. Like, it's, it's truly in our power and in the power of everyone here in the community to decide what are we going with the project and what are we doing. So please submit AGPs, vote. And again, thank you so much for coming today. Have a good conference. <laughs>